uh, shadow of playing in the game. But back to the demo cell. Right, please. When I was first looking at this painting uh, a half a century ago or more, the only thing that mattered about it was that it looked forward to the 20th, 20th century. I remember there was a phrase uh, which we heard again and again, which was the Demoiselle d'Avignon is the first painting of the 20th century. So this was um, like the book of Genesis, a whole new world which uh, prophesied the future of modern art. Uh, the way to think about it was to begin with to find an ancestor that could explain this revolution. And usually, uh, Cezanne was pointed to as the father, the grandfather, the great ancestor of modern art. In looking at the Demoiselle d'Avignon, uh, there uh, was a painting, uh, Five Nudes, which seemed to point in the direction of Picasso. And in fact, uh, one looked at the picture only in terms of an evolution uh, that moved from the past to the present into the future. Next on the right, please. The most exciting thing about the Demoiselle d'Avignon uh, was the fact that it shattered pieces of flesh it shattered solids, it shattered voids, and it seemed to be a kind of earthquake uh, that would eventually become a new language. The only thing about it that really mattered is that it pointed to what got to be known as cubism. Uh, a picture like this in 1908 seemed to be a logical evolution from the painting of 1907. Next on the right, please. And even more fascinating, uh, this uh, breakdown, this fracturing of bodies, of voids, of shapes, uh, would lead to a much stranger language, of which you have many examples in the exhibition here, in which uh, the human body, this is a female nude, is barely legible. So that uh, this was so exciting, the creation of the new language that is called cubism, that the only way we could look at the Demoiselle d'Avignon is to see it as the foundations of the new language of early 20th century art, which would in fact change the entire history. Art. This was 50 or 60 years ago, and uh, things have changed. And now one of the ways to look at the Demoiselle d'Avignon is not to look at it in terms of its only looking forward to the future, uh, but in a way of its looking backwards to the past, so that in some ways, uh, this picture, which used to be the first painting of the 20th century, uh, could now almost be thought of as the last painting, not only of the 19th century, uh, but of a much longer tradition, uh, which I will try to uh, indicate. Uh, next on the right, please. The subject of the painting in fact, it was almost never talked about. When I grew up in New York, uh, the picture was five naked women. But who were they? Uh, well, they were like five Cezanne bathers. They just did not exist in the real world. They were bodies which artists could play with, uh, construct, deconstruct as they would. Uh, a preparatory study for the Demoiselle over there it is an indication of the way in which we are looking at five naked figures who just seem to be the 
basic uh, uh, mold, the putty, the uh, marble, uh, the sculpture from which the uh, artist is creating a whole new idea of human anatomy. But in fact, slowly, it became very clear that the pictures did have a more complicated subject and that the subject had to do with sex and that even more to the point, it had to do with prostitution. Uh, next on the right, please. Looking backwards instead of forwards, uh, we learned that the Demoiselle d'Avignon uh, was really conceived as a picture of the inside of a bordello. And in the drawing on the right, uh, you can see on the left a potential client, a sailor, uh, who is coming into this room, and he will choose a prostitute uh, for himself. So that the painting suddenly has a whole new dimension of secrecy, of the erotic, uh, of the sexual. Uh, in fact, in the painting itself, uh, you can see that the woman on the left is raising the curtain so that there is a sense of a theater, of a spectacle, uh, which is the spectacle of these naked women, uh, the set. Uh, if you think about the work this way, and people began to think about it this way, it has a completely different uh, genealogical table. Next on the right, please. Oops. In fact, uh, looking back to the 19th century, uh, there is a very long history, uh, usually clandestine, uh, of artists uh, who depict uh, the sexual commerce uh, between men and prostitutes. Uh, here is one uh, by a uh, minor French artist, Constantin Gies, uh, which we know Picasso knew, he referred to it, and this is a scene of English sailors uh, who are confronting two prostitutes. Next on the right, please. Closer to Picasso, uh, and a far greater artist than Gies uh, is Degas, uh, who in the late 1870s made many uh, prints uh, that illustrated uh, the secret life uh, of a bordeaux. Uh, here is one of them in which we have the madam and all of the girls around her uh, who are displayed in this wanton way, pink flesh, uh, very much like the image that you have in the Demoiselle. And just as an interesting fact, uh, Picasso knew these prints by Dugas, and much later in his life, uh, when one or two of them went up for sale, uh, he was very eager to acquire them. So that this is part also of the background of the painting. Next on the right, please. One of uh, the aspects of the sexual nature of the painting has to do uh, with the sense of fear. Uh, there is a lot of horror in this painting, especially in the face of the woman on the right who is squatting, and uh, I'll show you this head in particular. Uh, looking at this, uh, you almost feel as though you are confronting a demon, something that is diabolical, something that has the power to kill. And in fact, more and more, uh, one has realized that in this painting, uh, there is also a sense of association between uh, sex and death, especially uh, promiscuous sex, as in uh, the world of prostitution, and the possibility of acquiring a venereal disease. I will have more to say about that in a moment. Uh, the head on the right uh, was very often associated 
with African art. The next slide, right, please. Here is an example of a mask, but usually the comparison had to do with the freedom of the African artist to distort, in this case, the human face, uh, in order to make a more powerful image. Uh, but here uh, we can see as well uh, there is something terrifying. This is actually a mask about sickness, and uh, this is something uh, that is also conveyed in the demoiselle. Next on the right, please. In fact, the history of prostitution in the art of Picasso and in the art of his contemporaries uh, can reveal a great deal about the painting. Uh, if you look at this picture by uh, Picasso, this is 1904, three years before the Demoiselle. It is, in fact, a picture of a procuress in Barcelona uh, who is referred to in Spanish tradition as una Celestina. Uh, this uh, phrase, Celestina, uh, comes from a uh, great uh, Renaissance uh, literary classic of Spain uh, by Fernando de Rojas called uh, La Celestina. Anyway, she is a procuress, and uh, I want you to notice uh, the hideous eyes here. Uh, one of her eyes is blinded, uh, the other one isn't, and this combination, which is very, very frightening, also appears in the uh, squatted, uh, squatting figure on the uh, right, the one I just showed you. Uh, in fact, uh, this was a very real woman uh, who had real experience with Picasso and his friends in Barcelona. Next on the right, please. There she is, looking like uh, a witch, a bruja, uh, with a prostitute. And there on her right is one of Picasso's friends, Sebastien Junier, uh, one of uh, his uh, Catalan friends, so that he is buying the prostitute and the hideous woman, the Celestina, that is in charge uh, of uh, the uh, Congress. The next on the right, please. The subject of prostitutes uh, and of uh, the evils uh, of prostitution was, in fact, a very popular one at the turn of the century. And here is a rather extraordinary painting of 1906 uh, by a Spanish artist. Uh, his name is Romero Torres. Uh, he's from Cordoba, where there is a museum of his work. And this is a notorious painting of 1906, which uh, was titled Those Who Live by Love, that is, uh, women. Uh, whose life uh, has to do with sex. Uh, these are prostitutes in Andalusia, probably Cordoba, uh, the artist's uh, hometown. And this was a very, very scandalous painting in 1906 because it dared to deal with the theme of prostitution. Uh, and uh, there is little doubt that Picasso was aware of it uh, the picture, in fact, was exhibited outside Spain, uh, where it was a scandal and it was in all the newspapers. Next on the right, please. I mentioned before the association of promiscuous sex, of uh, prostitution, and uh, evil death, uh, the possibility of acquiring a venereal disease. Uh, here is a poster from Barcelona made by one of Picasso's friends there in 1900. Uh, his name is Ramon Casas. And this is a uh, publicity an ad uh, for a cure for syphilis. Uh, it is very interesting to see 
the image of the woman here because she is uh, really blasphemous. Uh, she is an image of the Virgin Mary. Uh, she is holding a white lily in her hand, but it is her left hand, sinister. Uh, and then in her right hand, behind her mantilla, she holds a snake, uh, which is like the snake in the Garden of Eden, uh, but it also is evocative of a germ, a microbe, uh, that uh, causes syphilis. So that this is uh, one of the many familiar images of the period in which prostitution is associated with disease and death, uh, an experience uh, that I believe, and others do too, uh, is uh, evoked as well in the Demoiselle d'Avignon, especially the squatting figure we have been looking at. Next, please. Here, in fact, is a, another painting, uh, Spanish from the turn of the century, that deals with syphilis and uh, with uh, human misery. Uh, this is a painting by uh, the very, very successful uh, Spanish artist Sorolla, uh, who showed this picture at the Paris World's Fair in 1900 which was the uh, debut of Picasso. Picasso uh, had one picture accepted uh, for view at the Paris World's Fair of 1900 and uh, in the Spanish section. And this was uh, another more famous painting, which won a lot of prizes. The subject of this painting by Sorolla is called, the title is Sad Inheritance. What that means is that these are children of syphilitic parents. In other words, their parents have sinned. Uh, the children are uh, deformed, handicapped, and they are being taken care of by the priest uh, at the water here. So that uh, this is again an image that reminded everybody, this was a very famous painting in 1900, about the facts of uh, promiscuous sex and venereal disease. That is one uh, aspect of this painting that was completely unknown, completely unthought about in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. The next on the right, please. That slide. <clears throat> uh, another uh, way to look at it uh, involves the uh, traditions of the representation of female nudes, of the choice of the most beautiful nude, or also uh, the Orientalist tradition of harem scenes. Uh, I'm showing you here uh, a painting in the Prado uh, by Rubens. Uh, Picasso must have known it well. He knew everything in the Prado. And this is a very familiar subject, uh, the judgment of Paris. Uh, this is, as it were, a proper mythological interpretation of the narrative of the Demoiselle Gavignon, uh, namely, the young man of Paris is choosing the most beautiful woman. Uh, so that it is, in fact, uh, an act of erotic choice among uh, this, uh, this trio of uh, naked graces. Next on the right, please. The painting also is deeply rooted in uh, the traditions of 19th century art that deal with exotic sexuality. Uh, here is a very famous painting by Delacroix, uh, The Algerian Women, uh, which Picasso, in fact, uh, was later to use for a whole series of variations. Uh, but this uh, picture of a uh, scene of uh, uh, <coughs> Algerian women uh, offers, among other things, 
uh, the sense of some kind of secret theater, secret enclosure, and also the exoticism of different races, because there is a black woman on the right in the middle of the Arab women, uh, just as in the demoiselle, uh, the skin color and the facial type changes so that we move from a world of Western Europeans, of Caucasians, of white people, into a world that is Arab or a world uh, that is black. Next on the right, please. Uh, this is uh, particularly true of uh, the famous tank of uh, Van Tuch, the Turkish bath. Uh, and this is a painting that Picasso knew inside and out. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, in the background, there are also exotic women of different racial types very much like in the Demoiselle uh, d'Avignon. And this, too, is a scene of uh, total sexual uh, abandonment. Uh, it is one, next on the right, please, that already fascinated Picasso in the year before the Demoiselle. Uh, this is the painting of 1906. Uh, of a harem scene, which is clearly inspired by the painting uh, that we just saw of my man. Next, please. And here is a, another painting by Ang, uh, who is an artist uh, who uh, probably uh, inspired more works by Picasso than any other uh, old master. Uh, this is one that also includes the theme of the curtains, which is very important in the Demoiselle. Namely, there is a sense of secrecy. This is a private, erotic world, and we enter it uh, as we would enter a private room or see an erotic fantasy on the stage. Next, please. Uh, I show you, because it is in the great exhibition here, a preparatory drawing for the Demoiselle d'Avignon. And uh, this is quite fascinating in terms of the reading of uh, the interpretation of the position of these two women. Uh, the woman on the left is standing the woman squatting over there, she is clearly squatting, and the woman between the curtains is also standing. But these two women look as though they are lying down. They have their hands under their heads. And if you look at the uh, preparatory study here, it is very difficult to tell whether she is lying down or standing up. Uh, in fact, the next on the right, please. She is in a posture uh, of uh, the most famous Spanish nude, uh, the Goya naked Maja, uh, the Maja desnuda, and uh, she too is part of uh, the sexuality, uh, the physical abandon of this painting, uh, so that it is very possible to read the two dudes here as lying on their backs uh, like that, uh, but also pushed upward in our face as if this were a sexual confrontation. Uh, I have one more thing to say about this painting before we go on to the second. Next on the right, please. And that has to do uh, with uh, the sense of blasphemy of something that is heretical, anti-Catholic, which is a theme uh, that is familiar in Picasso's work. I will have more, uh, as if uh, this was some kind of apotheosis of a, uh, a Christian figure uh, moving from earth to heaven. Uh, whatever. Uh, for the Spaniard in particular, the crescent at the bottom of a woman 
is something that is simply <coughs> uh, a symbol of the Virgin Mary and my own intuition, and you may or may not believe me, this is a, a speculation of mine, is that Picasso loved the idea of uh, confounding in one person a whore and a virgin. That, you may remember, is exactly what happened in the uh, poster for the syphilis cure, that it was the Virgin Mary, who was also a prostitute. And later, I, in discussing Guernica, I will show you many other examples of this kind of blasphemy on Catholicism uh, that uh, is uh, current in Picasso's art. Uh, the next on the right, please. This uh, is the second of the three paintings I want to talk about. <coughs> and it is also, in terms of my personal memory, uh, a picture that fascinated me, as it did everybody who saw it in New York, uh, because of its endless players of mystery. Uh, I just mentioned, as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, combination of uh, the Virgin Mary uh, and sexuality. Uh, and that is also apparent in this painting, too, uh, which is, uh, on the face of it, a picture of a young girl uh, who is looking at her image in an oval mirror and, as it were, beginning to discover, uh, to feel, her sexual impulses. Uh, the, the head of the woman there uh, has a white halo around it uh, with stripes, uh, which seems to suggest uh, that she is a virgin, a holy woman, except that the other side of her face is that of a whore. Uh, it is uh, red lipstick, uh, blue cheek, uh, yellow skin, uh, so that there is here already uh, the contrast between some kind of white halo purity and a sexual uh, courage from within. Uh, Picasso loved uh, sexual jokes, and you may have noticed already uh, that her left arm and breasts over here are a pun on an erect penis and testicles. Uh, and the breasts over there are also a pun, uh, so that they are not only breasts, but they seem to be fruit uh, from which a uh, green stem uh, is grown. So that uh, in looking at this woman, uh, there are all of these layers of internal sexual desire, as well as uh, the whole uh, biological world of reproduction, of uh, sexuality, of children, of life cycles. Uh, this was something that was already apparent uh, 40 or 50 years ago. The painter seemed to be charged with this uh, kind of biological imagery. But now on the left, please turn. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> uh, what was not known, strangely enough, 40 or 50 years ago, was that this was not a picture about uh, the abstract idea of a uh, young girl or a woman, uh, but that it was a picture of somebody very specific to Picasso 
a woman in his life uh, whose name was Marie Therese Voltaire. Uh, she appeared in his life in the late 1920s as his uh, mistress when he was married uh, legally to Olga, uh, whose portrait you have seen many times in the exhibition. Uh, and it's quite extraordinary in terms of the history of Picasso studies that uh, nobody in the 1940s, 50s, and even 60s ever thought that this might have anything to do with a real person. Uh, but there is a photograph of his mistress uh, from the late 20s and early 30s and if you look at her hair and her face, you will see that it is recreated in uh, the image of, of this famous painting of 1932. The next, please. Right. In fact, uh, Picasso made hundreds of paintings and drawings in which she is the muse. Uh, here is a, another one that it also involves a mirror, and you can see she has blonde hair there and there, which is reflected in the mirror and very much uh, in the character of Picasso. Uh, her hair is also a sexual pun. Uh, it is amazing, Picasso loved the human body and loved to make uh, jokes or people on Tonga on the analogy between one part of the body and another. In any case, uh, here we have a view of Marie Therese with her blonde hair sleeping, and the mirror uh, reflects the lower part of her body uh, so that, uh, as in this painting, uh, she is a creature uh, of generation. This is about biological cycles. Next, please. Here she is in Istanbul, uh, the very same model, and uh, you can recognize her. Again, uh, a little bit of blonde hair, which is combined uh, with lavender skin. Uh, Picasso very often invented color codes for his subjects, and uh, one of the ways in which he frequently depicted his mistress was in the combination of yellow for her hair and a kind of uh, light uh, lavender purple uh, for her body, uh, which has a kind of transcendent uh, sexual quality. Uh, the, uh, I might add again that this is a, another sexual joke. <coughs> because uh, it not only is like her head hair, but it is like her pubic hair. Uh, the next on the right, please. The tradition of uh, painting a woman looking at, a, uh, at herself in the mirror is again a very, very old one in Western art. I apologize for this. Uh, slide. <coughs> uh, this is again uh, one of the most famous nudes in Spanish art uh, by Velasquez, a scene of Venus looking at herself in a mirror. And it's interesting to see that the back view of Venus is very much like the one uh, that Picasso painted of Marie Therese Voltaire in the mirror I just showed you. On the right, please. Here uh, is yet another work in this tradition. Uh, this one by Titian. Next on the right, please. And here is one of much more direct relevance to Picasso. Uh, this is a painting by Manet in the Guggenheim Museum now. And uh, it is a picture uh, that uh, Picasso knew. It uh, was owned by a collector, Tom Hatzer, uh, who also uh, owned works by Picasso and had exhibitions of his work. 
and uh, in the year 1932, when this was painted, uh, Picasso knew this, and in fact, 1932 was a very important year for Manet, uh, who had been born in 1832, so that uh, this was the anniversary. It's interesting to see that the shape of the mirror is an uh, oval, uh, what is called a cheval glass, uh, which has a mysterious quality. Uh, you can see it here, and it was traditionally meant to be a reflection of the soul, as in the story of Psyche. The next on the right, please. There are also many traditions, especially in Spain, of a mirror view in which uh, the uh, vanity of the beautiful woman uh, is uh, responded to by the image of death. Uh, here is one from Spain from the 18th century, uh, a <coughs> painting uh, that belonged, in fact, to a Spanish surrealist writer, uh, Gomez de la Serna, who had actually written about Picasso. They were friends. And uh, it is certain that Picasso knew this image. Next on the right, please. And it was a very familiar theme of uh, the beautiful woman looking at herself as death in the 19th century. This is uh, a painting by a Belgian artist named Beers. Uh, Next, please. And in fact, uh, in the 20th century, uh, in Spanish art, uh, there are other uh, examples of this. Uh, this one, uh, notice in particular, the, uh, <coughs> the anatomical bisection. Uh, this is uh, a painting by uh, a contemporary Spanish contemporary of Picasso, Jose Gutierrez Solano, uh, which is uh, a traditional uh, horrible theme uh, called the Mirror of Death, so that uh, this is a uh, constant uh, motif, uh, especially in Spanish art, the idea of a mirror reflecting death, uh, which is also, uh, I think, integral to an understanding of this painting. Next on the right, please. Finally, uh, about this painting, I should like to point out something else. Uh, the wallpaper in the background uh, has, as you see primarily, for its color, red and yellow. Uh, red and yellow, as we know, are the national colors of Spain. And Picasso was extremely aware of that, uh, most uh, obviously in this painting, a Cubist work of 1912, in which you see the Spanish flag in red and yellow. Uh, but this is actually the ticket uh, to the uh, bullfight in the Corrida, and it says uh, Sol y Sombra, Sun and Shadow. But that is uh, the red and yellow, a kind of color code for Spain, and Picasso uses it again and again. The next on the right, please. Uh, it is very apparent in a, another famous painting from New York, from the Museum of Modern Art, the three musicians, and uh, the most convincing interpretation of this painting is that these are three cryptic portraits of Picasso in the middle and his uh, friends, Apollinaire and Max Jacob. But I am interested in the central figure, uh, who is a uh, kind of concealed self-portrait of Picasso, who often disguised himself as a harlequin and who represents himself in the colors of Spain, which is, after all, uh, his origin. Uh, what I am getting at is that uh, the choice of red and yellow 
as the primary color for the background is not only an indication of his Spanish uh, ancestry, the next on the right, please, but also a, an indication of possession. That is, uh, this is uh, like uh, heraldry. It is as though he was saying, this diamond pattern, which is like the Harlequin pattern that I wear, and these colors, red and yellow, mean that this is my property, my territory, and this is my woman. Uh, if you think that is exaggerated, I show you a painting uh, also uh, from 1932, the same year of Marie Therese Voltaire lying on the beach. And this is quite fascinating because it has the colors of two flags, blue, red, and white for France, and then the sexual parts, red and yellow, uh, the colors of Spain, uh, as if Picasso was saying, this is what belongs to me. Uh, the next, uh, I think that's going to be on the left, here in the, let's see, yes. The uh, third and last painting I will talk about today in terms of new and changing interpretations is of course the most famous painting, uh, uh, maybe of the 20th century, uh, the painting on the left, next on the right please, that represents uh, in Picasso's imagination uh, what uh, the destruction of the vast capital city of Guernica was like uh, in, uh, on the day of April 26, 1937, uh, when German planes flying for Franco bombed the city. It was in the late afternoon, and it was a market day, and many, many civilians were killed. Uh, there is a photograph uh, of the ruins of Guernica, the kind of photograph that Picasso would have seen in the newspapers in Paris. And it is worth mentioning, uh, in terms of the color or the non-color of Picasso's painting, uh, that uh, it is evocative, it is all black and white reside, it is evocative of a, new, of a news photograph, that is, the information, uh, the documentation about the destruction of the city came through the medium of photography, so that this almost has uh, the sense of a photographic image, as well as conveying the idea of mourning, of grief, blackness. The next on the right, please. <coughs> It is uh, worth mentioning that although this is supposed to be the documentation of the destruction of the city of Guernica on a particular day, April 26, in uh, 1937, uh, there is almost nothing about the painting uh, that uh, locates it in a specific place or time. Uh, there is one uh, very, very ominous, uh, malevolent exception to this, and that is the light bulb, which you see uh, hanging over the scene. Uh, it is a, a marvelous multiple image, and I mentioned before how Picasso liked puns on anatomy. This is a different kind of pun. It looks like an eye, but it also has in the pupil of the eye an electric light bulb, and it also looks like a bomb uh, which is exploding over the uh, city, so that uh, it conveys uh, something that is very much of the 20th century, that is a bomb and an electric light bulb, and something that is equally of the 20th century, 
a malevolent eye, which would be looking at the ground from above the way an aviator in a bonding plane uh, would have surveyed the target. Uh, but this is the only uh, part of the painting that has anything to do with the 20th century, and the rest of the picture, in fact, could have happened in the 19th century, or in fact, in antiquity. Uh, <coughs> it is uh, worth mentioning uh, that although the image was meant to be specific in terms of a, uh, a particular catastrophe during the Spanish Civil War, uh, the image has become uh, something that has stood in the imagination of all spectators as just an image of war and destruction. And uh, I am ashamed to say as an American, uh, that uh, there is a story about this picture and the <coughs> president. Uh, you may have heard that at a meeting of the United Nations, uh, there was, there is the United Nations building in uh, New York. Uh, there is a tapestry version of this, like the one that you have of the Demoiselle, and uh, when George Bush was having one of his political meetings, uh, they covered the image because it was too uh, uh, topical in terms of uh, the destruction of Iraq. So that the picture still has this uh, astonishing uh, afterlife. That is another subject. Uh, the next one, the right one. Uh, however contemporary it is, it is also a work which, like so many of Picasso's, goes back uh, to uh, really uh, primordial origins in the history of art. Uh, here is a diagram of the painting uh, which shows two important things about it uh, in terms of the structure. One is that uh, there is a very clear uh, triangular structure uh, which is evocative of a, a pendant of a Greek temple. Uh, that is one thing. Then there is a triptych sculpture, uh, structure, a main image, and then two wings, left and right. So that these are two very basic images. Next on the right, please. In terms of the history of Western art, uh, used for battle scenes, like Guernica in Greece. This is a reconstruction of uh, the <coughs> temple of Zeus in Olympia. Or, as a cryptic, next on the right, please, used for uh, other scenes of martyrdom, uh, as in the scene uh, by uh, Brunewald, the famous uh, altarpiece in Colmar, now in France, uh, which represents the crucifixion. And this uh, very, very dark, uh, frightening uh, painting of uh, the crucifixion is in fact a work that Picasso knew very, very well and made many variations on uh, in uh, the late like, 20s and early 30s. The next on the right, please. The subject of Eureka, in fact, uh, if you take away the bomb and the electric light, uh, might almost be related to any number of images of the, of the murder of uh, women and children in uh, art history. Uh, here is one by Poussin, of the rape of the Sabine women, which is again an old master painting that Picasso would later uh, make many variations of uh, in uh, his uh, uh, aging career. Next on the right, please. Uh, oh, that's that uh, slide. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. It is also a theme that is related to the massacre of the innocents. This is the Christian version of the uh, Sabine women, and uh, it has even been suggested this is a painting by Leo Rainey, that the screaming woman here is uh, related, provided inspiration uh, for the screaming head of the woman in Guernica. Uh, next on the right, please. The image of Guernica uh, also conveys the sense of the end of the world uh, insofar as the thundering horse uh, who enters the scene, <coughs> uh, who is uh, going to be killed or going to die, uh, it has the uh, sword already in its side, uh, but this is an image that evokes uh, a very familiar illustration uh, the, uh, to the uh, Bible, to the vision of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which you see here in a print by Dura. Uh, the next one, right, please. Other apocalyptic scenes, uh, this one from Spain, uh, may also figure in uh, the creation of Guernica. Uh, this is a scene of the deluge uh, from a Romanesque manuscript, Spanish, uh, which is uh, actually in Paris, in the Bibliothèque Nationale. And uh, Picasso knew this very well, and as it's often been pointed out, the uh, figures here uh, are uh, very similar. Picasso was always excited about seeing Spanish art, and here it seems to revive some aspects of the medieval tradition. Next, please. <clears throat> I mentioned before the theme of blasphemy in Picasso's art, the idea of representing a prostitute as uh, the virgin of the Immaculate Conception. <clears throat> here is a, another kind of blasphemy. Uh, the woman with the dead child over here is not the Virgin Mary. She is just an anonymous uh, citizen uh, of the town of Guernica uh, holding her dead child. But the image, next on the right, please, is one that is impossible to look at without thinking of the Pieta, <coughs> Jerry a particularly gory Pieta, uh, this is from Spain in the 17th century, uh, the kind that Picasso would have known well, uh, this uh, the Virgin of uh, Sorrows uh, by uh, a Spanish sculptor named uh, Juan de Mesa. The next, please. I mentioned before the way in which more and more we become aware of the uh, puns, the double and triple images that Picasso can put together. And here is an amazing one. This is the mouth of the screaming mother, but you can see that the tongue uh, is uh, like a spear. It is a uh, form that conveys pain. Uh, just uh, like the swords in the Virgin of Sorrows and the thorns on the head of Christ. So that this mixture of the uh, Christian martyrdom and suffering uh, is part of uh, the horror of this painting in which we have a feeling that all moral structures, especially that of the Catholic Church, have been destroyed. Next on the right of those. I mentioned before the way in which this painting seems to echo the traditional form of a cryptic part of the heritage of Christian altarpieces, uh, but it does it in a very strange way. Uh, because here on the left, you have a pieta 
the mother and the dead child. And there on the right is an image uh, that looks like uh, the crucifixion. Uh, these are images that would have been in the center of a triptych, but now they are pushed to the side uh, in a way that seems to suggest a complete uh, transformation, a complete destruction of, of these traditions. Uh, the next on the right, please. Uh, this, as you see, uh, is an image that uh, Picasso himself uh, had uh, often explored, the crucifixion image, and uh, he uh, made variations also on the painting by uh, Grunewald that I showed you. Next on the right, please. A, another uh, fascinating reference uh, to uh, earlier art is seen in the image of this woman uh, who comes out of her home uh, after the bomb has fallen and looks up at the sky uh, with the, uh, these absolutely uh, dazed, blinded eyes. The neck of this uh, figure is absolutely extraordinary in its length, and uh, so is its posture. And we have the next one, right, please, Karen? And uh, it seems very plausible uh, that Picasso's favorite painter, Annick, might have uh, provided uh, some of the anatomical fantasy here. Uh, this uh, painting of Jupiter and Thetis, as you see, has the longest neck in the history of art. And uh, she uh, looks up at uh, the heavens. Uh, she's looking at Jupiter uh, for help uh, with her son, Thetis, uh, Achilles, who is fighting in the Trojan Wars below. Uh, so this is an image uh, of a woman uh, who is, as it were, praying to the deity. Uh, but she has been transformed uh, into this uh, stunned, terrified woman who looks up at the heavens and doesn't see God, but instead uh, sees uh, the malevolence of the eye that is a bomb that has destroyed the city. Next on the right, please. And important uh, is not daylight. There is no natural light here, uh, but there is one candle, the light held by the screaming woman. Uh, but above all, there is the light of the electric uh, light bulb and the bomb. The next on the right is one of Picasso's uh, most important uh, ancestors, uh, Goya, uh, had really provided uh, the foundation for Guernica insofar as he also painted a blasphemous picture uh, in which all of the moral structure of the church seems to have died. Uh, it is also a painting the scene of the execution of uh, anonymous, uh, helpless uh, Spaniards under the invasion of the uh, Napoleonic troops uh, in 1808. Uh, this is a scene in which you have only one uh, source of light, uh, the lantern there, uh, which seems also to be the source of death so that uh, everything that falls within the light uh, rays of the lantern is going to die. Uh, the figure in the foreground, with its arms stretched out, is uh, a prototype uh, for the dead warrior here. Uh, but there is this uh, terrible feeling of two conflicting lights, uh, one the light that comes from the left here, and the other the light that comes from above, which is the source of destruction. And part of this uh, image, uh, I think, is inspired by Goya, uh, and you may also know it in the Goya painting, that the church in the background is seen under a pitch black 
night sky. So that the implication is uh, that uh, this is dead. This world of Christian morality has been completely extinguished, uh, which is, again, the feeling that we have in uh, the Eureka. Uh, you may note that even birds in the sky have been destroyed, and this bird falls like the Holy Ghost onto the uh, table uh, that will be sacrificed on the seeds, like a sacrifice from uh, a malevolent heaven. Finally, I have only one more thing to say on the right, please. It has uh, often been noticed that from the clenched fist of the dead warrior, there is this little plant growing in the foreground in the uh, very center of uh, the painting. And uh, insofar as uh, Picasso keeps revealing new possibilities of interpretation, uh, I have to offer you another speculation of mine. Could we have the next, please, on the right? <coughs> the uh, city of Gernica uh, is uh, very famous in terms of uh, Spanish history and the history of the vast country because uh, it uh, was the uh, original, the, the very first uh, parliament uh, in which they had a uh, democratic structure which was later commemorated in the 19th century by this neoclassic building. Uh, this building is uh, there today. Uh, I photographed it. And uh, what is even more interesting is that uh, in front of this building, which has a pendant, uh, rather like uh, the triangular structure here, there is what the Basques call the sacred oak. Uh, this is supposed to be the tree in which uh, the original founders of the Basque uh, government uh, where they uh, met. So that this is a symbol of the city. Uh, it is also a symbol of regeneration. And uh, it has occurred to me, but you don't have to believe me, it's just an idea, that uh, this image, which is a symbol of uh, Guernica and the Basque country, may also have been absorbed by Picasso in terms of the triangular structure, he knew what that building looked like, and the sense of uh, regeneration uh, coming from the soil. That, of course, may be total nonsense, but I offer it to you simply to indicate that there is no end to the study of Picasso. Thank you very much.
duygulu öne çıkıyor yoksa zekam öne çıkıyor. Well, uh, if I understand, uh, we are talking about the depiction of emotions. And uh, uh, the, the uh, fact of the matter is that Picasso is a genius at uh, depicting a wide spectrum of human emotions. And in the case of Yarnika, this is uh, one of the greatest examples uh, because uh, he is uh, almost like a uh, journalist recording the split-second uh, terror or response of the women in the city uh, when the bomb falls. Uh, this one has a dead child suddenly, and she just screams to the sky. Uh, so this is a primal animal response, and uh, the tongue, like a sword, uh, really conveys the sharp uh, pain. Uh, this one, hears is inside, and she hears the noise outside, and she rushes uh, to see out the window what is happening, and she's carrying a lamp. So the feeling of, uh, uh, again, a split second uh, emotion uh, with her head rushing out the window, and it almost looks like a, uh, the sound of an alarm, like something screaming uh, and getting louder. And uh, this is a particularly horrifying uh, image because the woman is on fire. She has flames on her dress, which are like the spikes on the bomb. And so she is falling, and this uh, gives you the sense of uh, the, uh, well, of dropping from a window onto the ground and being on fire. Uh, and this uh, image uh, is of a woman who seems to be uh, immobilized. She is stunned. Uh, her arms are back and her knees are bent. And she looks up uh, in a kind of bewildered way. But just these four figures have an astonishing range of emotion and these, of course, have to do uh, with the experience of the sudden terror. Uh, but that is just an indication of Picasso's genius. I mean, he can uh, show every kind of emotion, uh, especially sexual. That's one of his uh, greatest uh, achievements. And uh, this uh, is just a uh, sample. But uh, he's a master. Uh, of uh, everything to do with human beings. Bununla bağlantılı olarak 
Çünkü bu tabii ki çok soyut olarak yansımak. Birebir yansımak. Ama altyapı olarak beslenir. O anlamda Picasso'nun eserlerinde parçalanma ögesi ve e, e, pek tabii ki onun paralelinde e, insanlar, insanlar çok yoksul düşüşünü ve o anlamda da bir şeyin tekrar parçalanmasını, ruhlarını da ve yaşamlarını da bunun bir yansımasından beslenmiş olabilir. <gülüyor> Well, uh, the the idea of oh, the the idea and the the idea of a world that is being fractured, destroyed, is uh, one that is uh, very common in the interpretation of early 20th century art, and uh, it is uh, very easy to associate this with the uh, coming of the First World War. It's not only Picasso in Paris, but German artists uh, who are working before 1914 uh, who give you the sense that there is an earthquake, uh, that there is a volcano, that the uh, sense of material things are being uh, broken into a million pieces. So this is a very common visual and emotional phenomenon in art before 1914. And uh, it certainly is true that uh, Picasso anticipates this as well uh, with uh, the invention of cubism. Uh, that uh, is a very, very broad kind of interpretation uh, in which uh, one tries to find a correlation between uh, major historical events and the way in which uh, artists invented new languages. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, it's a very broad comparison, but I think it's one that is uh, very useful insofar as we know the 20th century uh, is a very different century from the 19th or any other one. Uh, the, uh, there was more destruction, uh, there was more violence. I don't know if this is true, but I think so. And uh, in terms of the disasters of the First World War and the Second World War, we would expect the artists to respond. And uh, no artist responded better than Picasso, uh, certainly to the events of the 1930s and the 40s, uh, than uh, seeing in this painting. And in a more metaphorical uh, way, the destruction of things that you can hold, uh, touch, traditional images, uh, a complete breakdown of uh, what was inherited from the past, uh, this is something that uh, we can also associate uh, with the changes in the early 20th century. But it's very difficult to make uh, a one-to-one -one comparison between the great uh, changes in history and specific works of art. But this is probably the best uh, example of the possibility of that kind of dialogue. Merhaba. Şimdi Picasso'ya dağıtıyoruz. Eğer Picasso, Picasso'ya dağıtıyoruz. Eğer Picasso evinden çıkacak işinden evine gelmek muhasebeci olsa ve resimlerini sadece e, birkaç tanrı yazdığını yapıyor. Yani ona dahil gelecek mi? Yoksa dahil olmasının bir sebebi de büyük bir yere herkese paylaşılması. Uh, well, he would be <coughs> that, that he shared the works with everyone uh, 
uh, is not that ingenious uh, since uh, a lot of artists share their works with a lot of people and that doesn't make them better or worse. Uh, he would be a genius even if uh, only one person had seen the works I and mean, he is uh, a genius all by himself without an audience. But if you don't have an audience, then you don't exist. But uh, there is a priority. The genius comes first, and then there is the audience who recognizes it. Uh, I don't know what else I can say. <laughs>